We will open the meeting. Sorry for the delay. Uh, welcome <clears throat> everyone to the May 24th, 2021 Hadley Public School School Committee meeting. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, adjustments to the agenda. I know one of the adjustments we were hoping to do uh, for Chris is to move uh, Chris's um, business manager reports up um, first in front of the presentation so he can eat dinner, not off camera and not before, <laughs> not scarfing it down. Um, then no, you have another meeting. I know you need to get to Chris. Uh, any other adjustments to the agenda required? I I would suggest perhaps that um, the school committee consider reorganization at the end. Otherwise you could potentially, I don't know that this would be the case, start with a chair end with a different chair. Um, just because after Chris, I also know that Carlos will be here uh, to present to us on the field. So if you're comfortable doing your reorg as your last item of business, um, then we could go from business right into Carlos and do the reorg at the end. That sounds fine. Perfect. Good. I'm going to send and Carlos a link. Perfect. Okay, great. So we'll move business manager reports up first and we'll move 4A to um, the end to be after 4H. All right, anything else? Okay, uh, with that, we'll move then into public comment. Um, again, public comment in this digital environment, we are using uh, the Zoom raise your hand function. So you can raise your digital hand. We will see it, we will unmute you and um, public comment has a three minute time limit where we would welcome your comments. However, we do not interact or conduct any kind of Q&A during public comment, but we do like to hear from you so we can consider that as we deliberate items tonight. Uh, with that, I'll just pause. We do have some members of the public on tonight and I will wait to see if anyone would like to participate in public comment. Going once. Okay, I see none. So we will move forward uh, with our newly reorganized uh, presentations and discussions items. We're actually gonna move business manager reports up next. So Chris, you are up with the expense, the grant and the revolving reports. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I have my town meeting tonight in where. So uh, unfortunately it starts in about 45 minutes and I need to get there. So um, thank you for moving me up. So I have the expense report first. Um, really not a lot um, to discuss at this point in time. Uh, we still are looking in good shape. We have a couple more payrolls to go, including the big one in June where it pays for all of the summer salaries, but we do have sufficient funds to pay for that. Um, we did most of the transfers of expenses to grants. You'll notice on the grants report that we pretty much used them all up at this point in time. So those are reflected on this report. Um, the one thing that we still have been unable to get done is to move the expenses, um, the COVID expenses to the town COVID fund. Um, I, I ran into some difficulties. They're still trying to check and make sure something with the state. I'm not really sure what that is, but um, there was some kind of issue they were having. So once they got that straightened out, I'm assuming we can just do the transfer. And so we'll have about an extra $77,000 or so that will show up on our report to spend. But again, I, you know, I, I have no concerns at this point in time. We have enough funds available to still finish the year um, and you know, we'll see what we have left at this point in time. Carlos just came into the meeting too, so just so you know. Um, but I can answer any questions anyone might have uh, regarding the expense report. Nothing from me. No? Okay, the next step that we'll do is um, go through all of the open purchase orders and we may, we'll most likely free up some additional funds there as well. What we do a lot of times at the beginning of the school year is put out blanket purchase orders. Um, these are for places like Home Depot and Alston where Jeff buys all of his cleaning materials and stuff like that. Rather than write a purchase order every time he orders a roll of paper towels or something, 
we just do a blanket one at the beginning of the school year for say $5,000. And he just keeps purchasing against that. But as we get closer to the end of the year, he has enough materials to get him through the end of the school year and into the summer. So we can close those out and that will unencumber the money and it'll show up as more that's available. So um, that's really the next step that we're just beginning now. Um, I also have the grants report. As you can see, there are, um, the majority of the grants are, are pretty much all spent. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the ones, uh, the, if you look at the ESSER 113 grant, there's still almost $24,000 to spend there, but that's a grant that we can roll over into the next fiscal year. So um, it's again, to cover COVID expenses. Uh, so we'll just bring that into next year to uh, help us out then. Um, the 134 digital student learning devices, that was a new grant that we just got, I think about two weeks ago. And um, it's for $16,526. It shows there's nothing been spent. Uh, that was as of May 19th, which was last Wednesday when this report was prepared. Today, we put through a bunch of expenses that are going to use most of that grant. So that one will be spent down. Um, we still have to transfer money to the circuit breaker fund, but we can carry over quite a bit of, of that money into next year as well. And that's always good to have, again, just in case we have an unforeseen uh, tuition or something we need to pay for, it's good to have that money available to us. Um, the 274 and 298 grants, those were grants we got probably in December they became available. And I know the 298 is, is going to be used to purchase iPads so I can reach out to David and uh, get those purchased. The 274 grant, um, we will also, you know, obviously make sure that this is spent by the end of the school year. Um, and then again, we, we had um, a number of expenses in those last two grants, the Innovation Pathways and Early College that are going to get more of those funds spent, but they actually um, happened again after this report was prepared. So next month, when you see this report, pretty much all of those grants at this point in time will be spent uh, down to their full amounts. I don't know if anybody has any questions on the grant report. And the thing is, I heard we, we know more about the ESSER 3 now. Is that correct? We do. Um, we got an email today. Yes, so we're getting about $436,000. It's a little less than we expected. Um, but it's, you know, still obviously a decent amount. So um, we, we just need to apply for that. But it's it's pre-approved basically. So we just need to get the applications in. And we have until October to do that. And Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, right? That's, or Chris, that's know your money, right? It's not like it has to be spent out in any time, time frame. We have until- October 2024. I yeah. think it's FY 2024. September of that year, I think, yeah. is when it ends. So, yeah, we, we have quite a bit of time. Oh, so it's actually fiscal 25. Excuse me. Yeah. October 24, fiscal 25. Right. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So we have three, 20, years, three years to spend it. Three years. Great. And then 20% needs to be spent on learning loss. Is that right? But the other 80%, it's pretty flexible. Uh, the... What I'm aware of is, although I could be confusing S or two, I believe that in one of them, it was 10% for mental health supports and social and emotional supports. Um, I don't know if it's 20% on learning loss, although um, we certainly are expected to make that a priority, which we would, we would identify. I mean, that would be the, those two priorities would be first and foremost, um, and then, Beyond that, it's pretty flexible. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, and there's <laughs> there's so many COVID grants that it's kind of hard to keep track off the top of your head, but I think it was um, $10,000 that was put aside for mental health. Thank you, Chris. Um, I said 10%, $10,000 yeah. set aside for mental health on ESSER. That's correct. And and for the ESSER 3, I just checked the email that Ann and I got today, and it is 20% for learning loss, mm -hmm. yes, so... Great. 
That's great. Any other grant questions at all? Okay, then we have the revolving accounts report. Not a, a lot of changes really uh, to be seen here. Athletics stays the same, um, you know, it, it, as you can see, it really hasn't changed much since September. Uh, the lunch account is down, but we're not showing the revenues uh, for the month of April. They weren't posted yet when I ran the reports. So we're looking at probably about $12,000 additional to be added. So the balance should be more around $35,000. Obviously, as we keep rolling forward in July and August is when we really catch up with these items. So uh, the good thing is that we're at least going to finish the year with a positive balance. That's always nice to see. Um, the preschool account is showing a 60,000. I did say we would probably be showing close to $100,000. Um, as you can see, we went down about 16,000 in the month of April. So if we did that again in the month of May, that would be 76, but then we have the big payroll in June, that would be uh, basically five paychecks. It would be the last check and then four summer checks for the two teachers in that program. So that's going to put us right around where we thought we would end up with. And then we can just transfer expenses out of that fund to bring the balance back up to the positive again. Um, student activity account, again, you know, obviously that just changes whenever we have student trips or, or some kind of events and they either deposit the fundraising efforts for that or withdraw to pay for them. Um, Hadley Kids really hasn't had a lot of activity all year other than some phone bills. And um, we just had a salary at the last payroll uh, just because they're starting to do some planning to bring the program back. And so uh, some hours were spent there, but as you can see, it's, uh, it's a couple hundred bucks. It really wasn't a lot uh, that we've seen. And school choice, is gone on its way back up. I did the transfer in December to move some expenses to there. It's been growing since. We will have another transfer after June 30th. It will happen effective June 30th, but it'll happen sometime over the summer to bring the balance back up to a, a zero ending balance. I would think it's, it's going to be probably another $300,000 that we would move at that point in time. Any questions on those at all? I was just gonna ask while you're here, um, given town meeting just happened on Saturday and I know um, some of the folks here attended, uh, just if you can kind of recap what, uh, how those uh, decisions and approvals impacted just our, our, our next fiscal year moving forward. You mean in terms of the, the budget that was approved? Yeah, and I think there was also, um, wasn't there, the ha was Hadley Kids in there too, in terms of a revolving account? The, the only piece, so what's changed on the town side is that they had to, they no longer need the revolving fund for Hadley Kids. That revolving fund would live in the school department. They used to kind of be the custodian of that revolving fund. And also there was a portion of, we paid for a portion, some hours a week of the park and rec director to assist with the program and that won't be happening going forward. So that, if that's what you're asking about, and I want the public to make, to be clear that it wasn't a vote to Hadley kids will exist next year. All it was, was that the revolving account will be something that you see in our school revolving accounts um, where you see it here. And any money that for Hadley for the after school program that was in a revolving account on, on the town side would be transferred into a revolving account on the school side. Thanks, Amy. I think we've covered that at a previous meeting, but that action essentially allowed that to mm -hmm. move forward with that in the coming year. Correct. Great. Any questions for Chris? All right, Chris, okay. thank you. Thank you. Good luck at your other meeting. Thanks a lot, I'll need it. Okay. All right, let's go back to the beginning here of the agenda. All right, so now we're going to move then into 
uh, presentations and discussion items. The first one being the update on phase one of the Hopkins Academy athletic fields with Carlos uh, from Berkshire Design, Nieto Mate. Uh, and I know Carlos is on, so. Two Carlos is. Yeah, I'm not sure which one, but that. I'm gonna ask one to unmute. Yes, and I, I'll explain quickly here. Uh, the reason why I have the other one is because we have, um, and I think you have, do you have to allow me to start my video too? Yeah. Yes, I think we did. Yeah. Oh, let me see if I can. Okay, it might be, so to explain quick, oh, there we go. Now you got me. Yes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm a human being, not just a, a voice in the void. Um, the other Carlos is if I need to share a plan or something, um, this is my laptop that you're seeing me with, but over here I have the desktop where I have all my CAD and I have all the drawings and that's the other Carlos. So if I needed to share something, I would, I would need to use that other one. Um, I, I don't think we will need, but if, if, if people need, need more explanation, I can pull up the plans and we can talk about things. Um, I, so in, in essence, I mean, we're, we're getting to the end of the actual construction project. Um, and for the Hopkins Academy, um, the majority, I would say 90% or 99% of things have been um, already installed. It's the process of, of getting um, the grass to grow, you know, to, to the appropriate size so that I can accept it for the contractor. And there were some other loose ends that, that were being um, dealt with. So that's, you know, the part of the project itself for, for, uh, uh, for us, it's, it's we're at the end, tail end of the project at this point. Um, I think you also wanted me here to explain um, right that we are at the end. There were some issues at the beginning of the season with, in spring where we had some uh, water pooling and some drainage issues. Um, and there was some talk also about or about the grass and cutting the grass. So I, I wanted to kind of focus on, on that. And, um, and again, in general, the project is at, it's at the tail end of this. And um, we're trying to just finalize, wrap up something so the contractor can, we can accept the project and the contractor can, can finish. Um, on the drainage part, um, so in the early spring, I was called and to let me know that there were some issues with ponding. I, I was out there before those issues were, I mean, before those weeks that we had some more rain and whatnot. And, just to look at how the site looked and went out to the with a contractor and take a look at things, uh, make sure that they had dewinterized the irrigation system. And at that point, the grass was still not, you know, we still needed more growth. Um, and the irrigation system was set up, um, and I'm giving you a little background of what happened before. Uh, irrigation system was set up be, uh, so that it would irrigate every morning at five o'clock and it would run through its programming. Um, so then we had a couple of weeks that was much more wet, wetter weather. Um, and also we had, you know, it, it was early spring or mid spring at that point. And that's, I was called, I believe I had a meeting on the 14th. So I was called probably a week before that, a couple of days before that. Um, again, there was uh, ponding and, um, and Christy Jardines called me just to make sure that I went by there and take a look and then to just sit down with them and, and talk about what the uh, conditions of the park were. Um, then we met out on the site and actually I went the day before because when I heard there was funding, I couldn't wait till the day of the meeting. So I wanted to go out there and just take a look at what was going on. When I went out there, the funding had subsided. There was some moist areas, but it wasn't like we had standing water at that point. Um, but there was evident that there were, had been some drainage issues. Um, when I went the next day, um, and we met all together and, you know, it was explained to me where the areas I had, um, uh, kind of that there were ponding and the other con uh, concerns about the infield mix being a little spongy um, at the beginning of the season, also being a wet, especially in the baseball field. Um, so after that, I sat down and talked with a contractor, talked with Jeff from, from the school, and I came up and I believe that Anne uh, shared my kind of my, I wanna say recommendations that, that we wanted to, to hit. Um, in the drainage, what I found was the there were a couple of things that needed to be done that I, I think are going to improve the situation. Um, one of them was that we had erosion control around all the drainage structures on the site because we wanted to prevent any silt to go into the drainage and then eventually make it out to uh, where it outfalls, where the water outfalls for the drainage. Um, 
by having those, they're literally dams right in front of each one of the catch basins. Um, and that's our sole drainage system. So if you limit the amount of water that can go through those, obviously you're going to have issues with ponding and you're going to have issues with humidity, especially in a, air, in a time when the year where you got ground that's pretty saturated, you got a lot of water. So any extra water that goes there will definitely pond. Um, so my, our first thing that I told the contractor, and at this point it can be done because the grass is, there's enough grass there, we're not going to have major erosion, was to take that out um, and to reseed those areas because obviously once you take the erosion control out, there's nothing growing underneath. So they needed to go back and reseed those areas, fill any gaps that were uh, happening around those catch basins. There was some settlement in some areas that also prevented some water to go to the right place. So we asked them to fill those areas that had settled. Um, and again, that's not a surprise in a project where the soils are very friable. They're fairly thin and you've moved all the dirt. So now we've, you've compacted everything, the winter has come by and then you, you start getting some uh, compaction issues that you have to come back and fill. So contractor is doing that too. So that was the first thing that I observed was that you still have the erosion control out there. So we need to take that out. So make sure that any water that goes can go to the right catch basins and then any depressions can be filled so that the water can go the right place. The second thing that uh, we talked about was um, reprogramming and sitting down with Jeff, um, making sure that the contractor explained to Jeff how to reprogram the irrigation system. Because uh, another thing that I'm uh, that I, I suspect was an issue too, was that we had a running irrigation system running every morning at five o'clock in the morning. It does have a rain sensor, so it will not irrigate when it's raining. But if it rains an hour before the irrigation cycle starts and the rain stops, it will irrigate. So you might have the, the fields totally you know, packed with water. You know, It could have rained for three days straight and your irrigation system is going to keep turning on as long as it's not raining at the moment it needs to turn on. So that's what a, a rain, uh, the rain sensor does. So there is a little management that has to happen with that, meaning, you know, obviously the irrigation in a place like this, this size, you're going to have areas that are going to be a little bit drier, soils are going to be a little different. So you have to adjust each one of the sections. And what, that's why the irrigation system is set up in, in all these, you know, areas so that you can, each one of those areas you can isolate and you can either irrigate less, turn off an area, or you can do it, you know, you can change it so that you can make it so that you get less water. So that was the second thing that I, you know, obviously it had been raining, but it had been irrigating all these days. Plus we were in spring, which is the time where we have the highest groundwater. In addition to that, you, we had a rain, you know, rain events a couple of, for a week. So having all that moisture there, that it, you know, it doesn't help. I mean, if you're irrigating for 15, 20 minutes in the morning in that same area. So um, that was the second uh, recommendation. Those two, um, as far as I know, because I called, I followed up with Jeff afterwards to make sure that the contractor had gone with him and reprogrammed. I called the contractor to make sure he had done that. And my understanding is that those two things, taking the irrigation, uh, the erosion control out and dealing with the any dips that or any uh, areas that had um, settled, that they were going to deal with that. And also with the irrigation, they reprogrammed it with Jeff so that, and the contractor's more than happy you know, he's more than willing to come back and, and reprogram it and work with Jeff on that. Um, these systems are, they're spanking, brand spanking new. They have a lot of buttons. They have a lot of screens. So, you know, you, you need to go through it a couple of times. It's like us with Zoom. <laughs> we have to go through it a couple of times before we, we you know, we, we are comfortable with it. So, and again, the contractor is more than, more than happy to do that. He's a local contractor. He can, he can come around and help Jeff with that. So I think on those two things are, First of all, I think those two things are going to definitely have some issues, you know, cause some of these issues. The other thing is that I, they're, they're taken care of um, already as far as I, I believe, and I'll follow up with contractor and Jeff again with those. Um, the second part that I put in there on, on, the, on my notes was any additional drainage. Obviously, when, you know, ponding was out there, the first uh, thing that was came up was, hey, there's, you know, we, we, we installed this drainage, we do we need more drainage? Does the, did the contractor did something wrong that the drainage is not working? And you know what? I went out there and double checked, and the drainage is working as it should in the sense that water is going to those low spots um, that we created 
so that we could catch that water with catch basins or drains. We, do, we don't have a lot of those in the site because of some reasons, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. Um, but as far as we can tell at this point, everything, the grading seems to be right. Um, things have been graded the right way. There's been some settlement, like I said, and that is normal in an area this size, even after comp compacting, um, especially with these soils that we have there. So things have settled a little bit, but nothing is way off that I could say that we have a catch basin that's a foot higher than the rest, or we have some you know areas that are just obvious that there are low low spots you know that are um, that have major settlements or something like that. So I think in general everything has been graded the right way, um, and we're working with you know with with the plan that we had. Um, this area in particular is this these fields are are challenging. Uh, the site is pretty challenging to start off with. Um, and I, you know, from the beginning, this has been a process for a long time, but um, so we have several things that are going against us in regards to water in the site. We have, we are in floodplain to start off with. So when we graded this site, I, we could not add any more soils. We, we, we can't uh, fill in this site. And it's in a, per, a foot per foot basis, meaning I cannot fill anymore between contour line 100 and 99, and I can't fill from 99 to 98, and I can't fill. So it's not like I can fill a lot on one side and make a big hole on the other, and that's going to fix it. I have to actually match it foot per foot of grading. So what that means on a site like this is that I can't really raise anything, so everything needs to go down. So if I want to drain things, it's not like I'm raising one side and then letting things drain. It's more like I have my natural elevation and I need to bring that down so I can bring the water to a spot that's low. That leads to the fact that we have, in addition to being in floodplain, so that limits us on how much we can grade, how much we can raise the site, is that we have really high groundwater in the site. Uh, we have groundwater that's in spring in the, in the high moments. In some areas is as shallow as 12 inches and it goes down to maybe 24 inches, but we have water that's fluctuating early in the season in around 12 inches below the surface. Um, this is also the lowest spot in this area. Um, so most of our fields are draining from the agricultural fields are draining and, and that happens underground on the water table. It's just moving a lot of water swimming this way. That's why we have the ditch at that corner. That's the lowest point. That's where all the water goes to that area. So we have, we're, we are in floodplain, so it's, we can't really raise our elevation. And then we have re high groundwater. So I can't, like I was saying, my strategy was to create low points, but I can't really bring that down significantly enough. You know, I can't really go way down on that uh, drop because I'll be in, in floodplain. I will be basically bringing, yeah, I'll be, sorry, in a water table. I'll be exposing the water out. So it was, it is a balance on this site. It's a large site and the grades have to be relatively flat, you know, for playing fields and whatnot. So with all that said, um, I, I feel like we should, I mean, there's an opportunity of maybe doing some extra drainage. Um, additional drainage would not be covered by this contract because it wasn't the responsibility of the contractor. It wasn't part of the design. Um, Additional drainage, when I say this, would be what's called under drain. So it would be drains that are actually buried on the ground, um, which would handle some of this water and, um, and, and drain out. Those drains need to go to structure. So what we have right now is the framework of what we would need if we needed under drains. We have a system of four or five catch basins that now if we needed to add more drainage, we could connect to those. If we were, you know, so if we had started from the beginning with other drains, we would have needed this four or five big structures that we have out there right now. So just so you understand that we are in step one of drainage, if we needed to go to the next step it would be under drains, but it wouldn't be, uh, we're starting from scratch. It means that we're adding to the system that we already have there. Um, my feeling right now and under drains, it's not cheap. Um, it's expensive because you have to have pipe, you have to have stone, and this area is really big. So we, that was not, you know, within the budget of what we were working originally. So we were working with the drains that we we could afford and we could work make this work. 
my feeling right now is that I would wait. At, one last thing, you know, grass had not really developed its final root systems here. Um, that takes a whole year. You know, it takes mowing, constant mowing during the year. Um, those the grass root system is going to be when it's healthy. It should be about twelve inches deep. You know, it, it's 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 a lot of, of um, surface area. Um, the grass itself is a way to drain some of that water. I mean, the grass is going to absorb it, and also there's transpiration happening with the grass. So when you have really early grass, it can't transpire as much and it can't absorb as much. But I'm fairly sure as we keep moving forward and this uh, grass gets established, we'll have a better it'll have better capacity to to dry up that uh, that site. So my feeling is that on the drainage, I would wait till we get to next spring. Um, we are doing all these additional things that we hadn't done, meaning we took the erosion control out. We're going to have established grass for the next time. We'll have an irrigation system that's not going to turn on at the beginning of the spring because we know now that we can't, that field should not be watered at all in the beginning of the spring. And we will, and I'll get into a little bit more detail, but the infield mix uh, areas that were spongy, the contractor is going to come back within this contract and he's going to re roll that, recompact it, and add any extra material he needs. So that is going to be taken care of by this uh, contract. So my feeling is that we should wait and see how, how it pans out for next spring. Um, if you still are having major issues with drainage, um, which again, I suspect that by taking the erosion control, that's gonna take a lot of that extra water that was there, there. Um, then I think that's the time where you should be thinking of extra drainage. Um, but I wouldn't jump into it right now and try to get extra drainage right now in there if you haven't seen how this is gonna pan out for next season, when the, you know, the fields are gonna be more finished, grass is gonna be more finished, and our drainage is gonna be, and the erosion controls, it's not gonna be there anymore. Um, so that's where we are with, with the drainage um, and where I, my recommendation or what I think about it. Um, there's also a, uh, we, and I just want to touch base back on that. It's just the infill mixes, which is again, the, because of the moisture that was there, um, the infill mix was spongy. It, it hadn't, it didn't feel compacted. Um, and we've asked the contractor to come back, re-roll that infill mix and then add any additional infill mix. Um, he's not gonna do that immediately. Um, that infill mix that he bought is from out east, is from a, a distributor out in, I wanna say closer to the Cape, um, where they have the sandy, sandy material that they use. He has another project um, that he will need uh, infill mix. So he asked us if we could wait till he has that project, you know, he goes to get that material. Um, a good way to control that too is that project is with us too. It's for Springfield, but it's a Berkshire design project. And we are, so we know when he's getting more extra material and whatnot. And he, it is true, he will be finishing some ball fields out there. Um, so it, it felt like it was, uh, it made sense to, for the contractor and for us, but for the contractor to wait till he did one trip and brought extra material. So he's, um, talked about coming in and re-rolling and bringing the material. He should do those two things at the same time. Um, so he's going to come in and do that. And that, I believe, is going to be in a couple of weeks uh, from now. He's still not, not ready uh, to go and get that material. Um, that's not going to impact anything in regards to the playability or anything of the fields. And it's going to be even drier, so it's going to be better for compaction. So, um, so that's the... Um, I guess the the update on the in, in the infield mix and um, and that sponginess and compaction that he was that he needs to come back and, and do again. If you have any questions, I mean, I you could have interrupted me at any point. I I like talking, so. Um, <laughs> but um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, so Annie I, and Paul, I, did you guys have any comments? Paul, I know you've been closely involved with this project. No, I, I don't. I, other than thank you, Carlos, for your diligence here. And it looks like we're close. I know there's mowing that's important too. Mm -hmm. so, so once we accept the fields, I know that's a, there's a formal acceptance and all of this becomes our responsibility. So Annie, it sounds like Jeff's been looped in. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll turn to the school administration to take over the mowing and make sure the sprinklers are working properly. Correct. Yes. 
Yes, thank you, Carlos, for coming out to meet with us, for walking the fields on your own, for walking the fields with us, and for all of your recommendations, um, <clears throat> which the email where you summarized all of your recommendations that you now went over publicly was um, shared with the school committee on the document. Um, so guess, thank you for that. And I just want to reiterate, you're suggesting that um, we wouldn't, you would not recommend one that we look at if we are going to expand the drainage that we don't do that until phase two or at least until next spring. And I have to go get a glass of water before I just pass out and choke, but talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. <laughs> no problem. And, and yeah. Carlos, the other thing too, if you can chime in too, talk about the lilacs that we're going to be planting. The, yeah. the lilacs, sorry, I did, I, I did not hear. The, the lilacs in the abutting neighborhood? When they're oh, going. they're they're already planted. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're already planted. They actually did that probably a couple of weeks back. They're flowering. They look great. I don't, I haven't, I haven't heard from the neighbor, but we, when we spaced them and everything, he was out there and, you know, he saw us do that. So I, I, I haven't heard that sometimes means that it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll go check it out. Thanks, Collins. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah. And, and on, on the, I, I correct with and interpretation, I think we, we should just let it, let the fields kind of settle, you know, wait till next season. And, and then if we still have some drainage issues there, we'll deal with those at that point. But I, I, I don't think you should go ahead and, and start investing on uh, extra drainage until you can see how, how this goes. I talked to Jeff too, you know, in, in, in regards to coordination, for instance, if next season, you know, can, can he, you know, if you have a field that's really dry and you have a field that's a little wetter in the spring, could you start on one side and, and then move to the other side? You know, all these things, all the management that you can do within, you know, your facility can help. Um, early spring is, a, it's hard. Baseball is hard because you got early spring is, you got normally pretty wet, you know, wet weather, especially the last two years has been pretty wet weather in the spring and for springtime. You have high groundwater. So it's the time of the year that's harder. Um, so it, it's, again, the management of how you can deal with what you have also helps, you know, throughout the process. So I, again, I, and I talked to Jeff also about um, grass mowing and we've talked about it. And I, I believe that he's, you know, like he's more than clear on, on, on what it takes. And, and I think I was worried at the beginning that he didn't have enough help to do it because it's a large, really large site. And it, you don't realize that until you start mowing. Um, <laughs> that all of a sudden you have twice the amount and that am amount, you know, multiplies in time. And all of a sudden you have, you don't have time to do enough mowing. You know, I've, I, this is not the first place I've seen that um, happen. But uh, a after we've had a bunch of conversations, it seems like Jeff has had, he has new help that's coming in and helping him with that. Um, and, and that he's going to be more than capable of dealing with it um, once, once we, you know, the contractor is done. So. So I think the, all that stuff is, is is good. Also, the he was having some issues again. Those areas that were moist, it was hard for him to mow. But now that that's all that area is going to dry. I mean, it's it's dried up already uh, quite a bit. So he's not going to have that issue anymore. And Annie, I think it's time for us to get in front of the CPA just to close out the project. And um, but I looked at the town meeting. I need I need to maybe get with the town manager to find when I I can get on their calendar because I I don't see any upcoming meetings for them. That would probably be your best bet. Go through okay. the, we can, you or both of us can go through the town administrator and see when we might give them a, a status update and then probably start planning and thinking toward phase two. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Again, feel free to contact me, Paul, you know, you, you got my email. So if you have any questions or anything comes up, you can just email me and um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep, uh, moving forward with the project and, and getting this wrapped up. Great, thanks. Thank you. Great. Well, we are super excited to be using the fields, hopefully this Friday for an outdoor graduation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Let's hope there's no rain and there's no uh, pooling of water. Yes. All right, great. Um, we're gonna move then to the next topic, school start time proposal and schedule for surveying staff, students and parents, Annie. Yes, so what we've done to date is send out a, a survey, just a very quick survey to the Hopkins Academy staff to get their feedback. We sent it to all staff. We received 31 responses. And of those 31 responses, I just wanna pull this up here. 
of those 31 responses, the majority, of course, because that's the majority of employees, but um, the majority were unit A members, teachers, counselors, related service providers, 21 respondents were teachers, seven respondents were educational support professionals. We heard from two of our food services staff and one of our ad admin support admin assistants. Um, we simply asked the question, um, what would, what, which choice do you believe might be in the best interest of students? Instruction beginning at 845, and I'll explain more as to why we suggested that, 845 and ending at 315, or keeping the current schedule of the respondents, 17 indicated that beginning at 845 and 315, that they thought that was a good idea, and 14 respondents, um, so it was almost evenly split, about 55%, 45%. 14 respondents said, keep the current schedule. And um, then they went on to provide, in some cases, some comments. And some of the reasons uh, that people indicated, some of the concerns that they had, some people just said, great idea, and, and, uh, and kind of echoed what some of the CDC recommendations are. But others asked some questions about um, Athletics, and I really want to be clear, this isn't about people putting athletics before academics, but recognizing that um, students do more than, than the, I mean, they have very full lives. And so, especially in a town like Hadley, do we have to think about fall sports when it gets dark earlier? We don't have lights. What does that mean for sports like soccer um, in the fall? And um, what does it mean? One person asked a question of when there's not a whole lot of daylight, will that have adverse effects on students' moods in the afternoon? Um, and I'll just explain a little bit of why we threw this particular time out. So there are many options. The least disruptive option is to almost try to leave the elementary school alone in terms of schedule and really only tweak with the high school schedule. In some districts we've talked about, Northampton is looking at a, a round or about an 8.30 start for high school. Amherst is looking at about a 9 a.m. start next year for high school. So a lot of places just end up flipping their schedules with their older kids and younger kids um, because they can't, they don't have the option of putting all grades on one, what we call a single tier of busing. So what happens now, a two tiered busing system means those drivers get on the road at six-ish in the morning and start collecting high school students, right? Shortly thereafter, they get to the yard, they start going about and trying to get high school students after they, they do all of their safety work in the bus yard. Then they drop off the high school and then they do the same run more or less, they do a similar route and they pick up elementary students. So that's two tiers. In a single tier, you just route everybody. If all your schools start pretty close, not at the exact same time, you drop off at one school and then you go to the next school. So if you leave Hadley Elementary schedule more or less alone, you would drop off at Hadley Elementary School first, and then you'd go drop off at Hopkins Academy. Um, you could drop off at Hopkins Academy first, dropping them off closer to the 8.30 mark, and then go over to the elementary school and start the elementary school later. So what we were going to do after our meeting last month, and this is extremely important that the public understands this, and of course, just to reiterate to students and faculty and staff, one, we, we have done one survey right now with Hopkins Academy staff, that's it. So we're very interested in hearing from families, and also from students. Um, and any decision that if the school committee were to determine that this is something that we would very much, they'd be, you'd be interested in moving forward with, that can't happen without negotiating with the Hadley Education Association, because this does constitute a change in working conditions and change in working conditions must be impact bargained. So this is not a unilateral change. I'm not suggesting that the school committee thought they could make this unilateral change or wants to, but I just want folks to understand that not only are we looking for input, we're not done getting input, just started, but also it would have to be um, 
bargained. So I wanted to hear from the school committee. And then my next steps, of course, would be to um, survey uh, families, similar, very kind of straightforward survey, and, um, and students, Hopkins Academy students, or to take any other actions that the school committee would like me to take in order to help you guys have a conversation about this. Um, I will remind people I know that we had a meeting about single tier busing. Again, that means students in grades K through 12 could be on the same bus. And there were some concerns in the past about what that means for younger children. So we talked at the last meeting, uh, several school committee members suggested the idea of having bus monitors on each bus. We do have bus monitors. Um, this is something that COVID brought about. So that's we're happy to continue that to make sure we have bus monitors. We talked about it hasn't been easy for anyone recently to find a lot of employees, but just like we have hired very responsible seniors from time to time to work in our after school program. Uh, we could certainly, you know, advertise to some of our responsible um, older students whom we uh, hire to work in our after school program. And I spoke with the transportation coordinator and she said that there is nothing to prohibit students from using devices and headphones. We have a lot of those now, another upside to COVID. Um, and so perhaps encouraging students while they're on the bus to, um, you know, to have a device and headphones if there was concerns about um, younger children being privy to conversations that older children might have. Um, and those are just some of the ideas we've had today and uh, happy to listen to the school committee's conversation or take any suggestions from the school committee about recommended next steps. Thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting to look at the results of the survey and, um, you know, it's fairly split, right? Almost evenly between uh, um, the change versus keeping the current schedule. And the comments were very interesting. It was nice to be able to at least get a little bit more insight into some of those um, uh, ratings. And so I guess a question is, um, I mean, I, I do think this is worth an idea worth exploring, but I, I, I would definitely encourage the gathering of additional input in that exploration. So you mentioned families, um, students getting their feedback. I think it's nice for folks to have the framing of what um, other schools that are uh, close by are doing um, and how, uh, it, I mean, for schools that have already done this, how sports or clubs are addressed or what would be the, the thought around that uh, in terms of, you know, we're not necessarily going this alone, right? Uh, so I think that would be helpful framing and the ideas around the buses as well in terms of um, understanding that. But, uh, you know, I know we've had presentations from um, the medical perspective and kids uh, health, the pediatric perspective in terms of uh, the health benefits. And I think those are worth considering. So, you know, it's something that I, I, I would like to hear more about other sources of input be, to be able to explore this more fully. What do you guys think? Well, I um, agree with you, Heather. I uh, appreciated seeing the comments. I, um, I think the data are pretty clear around the nation uh, in terms of the research that shows that the later start time has been uh, net positive for students. And uh, while it might be darker in the evening time, it is lighter in the morning, a little bit less depressing to wake up to the darkness and, and climb onto a dark bus down a slippery driveway in the winter. Um, so six of one, half a dozen the other, I guess. Um, I, um, I've always longed for stadium lights on our fields. <laughs> so maybe that's a phase three, <laughs> that we have some stadium lights that allow for uh, soccer uh, uh, lighting. But, I, you know, more practically speaking, how have our neighboring school districts, which seem to have really taken this post-COVID opportunity to have the later start time, how have they managed um, some of the issues that uh, we raise here in our district? I, I will let you know that um, a athletic director, Eric Sednick, is speaking to the two ADs on either side of us. Now, we don't play 
a number, they're different divisions. So I'm, I'm not going to do justice to this, but we don't play a lot of sports against those teams because they're typically in a different decision division. Although we have a number of co-ops, right? With I think swimming and lacrosse and hockey and football with those, I'm probably missing one with those districts. So we will be impacted about in, on the athletics front regardless because our co-ops are with those districts. Give me just one moment, please. I'll have to let Tom know I'm in a meeting when he walks in the back door. That'll just take me a second. So um, <laughs> I, um, and then I also thought it might be helpful if this went to the staff and I'm not sure that the public is completely aware of this. So I just want to read um, the, the, the mandate that the state legislature, the task force studying this has. So the state legislature has convened a task force which shall and it goes through a number of things about researching start times and looking at the effect of start time on student health. And then the last thing it says, and this is part of their mandate, the task force will suggest that a later school day start time is beneficial to student learning. So I, I will say again, it appears to me that it is not a question of if we will be changing our start, but it is simply a matter of when. It's an interesting mandate to a task force. So they're not, so they're, they're tasked with coming up with pretty predetermined recommendation. But I, I, I agree with you, Humara, the, the data that I've seen are pretty compelling, right? And, and I think we do need to, I think that's why Northampton and, and Amherst have shifted. So if we can hear these concerns from the families and from the teachers and find ways to, to, to mitigate them to the extent we can, I think it really, from my perspective, um, this is the way, obviously, it sounds like the state's going in our neighboring schools. So how do, we, how do we get there and make it work for us? Knowing that we're a smaller school district, that bus expenses are expensive for us, it's six, $700,000 a year. So we don't wanna uh, increase that if we can, we can avoid it. So I, um, I agree with everything that's said thus far. And um, I think I was probably one of the most cautious when we talked about this the last time. And, you know, as I start to look at um, information available and surrounding districts um, and um, medical opinions, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's definitely worth further exploration. And I'm wondering, um, you know, and I, I, I also think it's good to get further feedback. So this was a great starting place with AJ and I agree with Heather and, and I know you suggested it, Annie, getting further feedback from parents, but maybe maybe framing it a little bit. And I find that your superintendent emails always seem to be a great place to frame it. So maybe, um, you know, giving, giving the community um, the heads up that a survey is going to be coming to seek their feedback, but also providing them with information, relevant information, um, prior to the survey coming out um, of the positive benefits, what we're looking into, giving them a little bit of background on why this is coming about, um, you know, and, and where we may be headed as a state, giving them that information up front, allowing them time to read that ahead of time before we send out a survey might be useful so they can make an informed decision while they're filling out a questionnaire. And maybe it's less alarming that way, you know, that this is coming back up. That's a great idea. I had some of it. When I sent the survey to the staff, there was a lot of that kind of in the background, but some people just skipped that description, right? And I also, though, had an email in which the survey was embedded that laid out what I read to you, the mandate from the task force, what's happening in neighboring communities, and a link to the CDC website where it states and highlights that they recommend that middle and high schoolers do not start school before 8.30 in the morning. Right. So I can share that with families too in advance and yeah. then send out the survey. In advance, we'll just give them some time to read because you're right, a lot of people are probably not gonna click through that or take that time, they're gonna answer that survey. So if they can at least be prepared for that to come, they might even do a little research on their own too, so. I'll just add that I, I agree with everybody, I think, uh, and I think it's a great idea. I also think that if it's something that's going to happen, if it's going to come from the state that we need to do it, it's 
it's good to get out in front of this and, and learn as much as we can about our community and, and what the feedback is. And then also it gives us the opportunity to think of ways that we can maybe make other changes within the, the schools to, to adjust for this, this time change. Great. So Annie, I know this, this isn't an action item, but more, um, we, you know, appreciate the update, appreciate seeing the results of this preliminary survey. And it sounds like um, you've got some feedback for at least being able to move forward with some additional um, uh, getting a gathering of feedback with the framing perhaps that Tara mentioned. Yep. Great. Okay, anything else on this topic? No, not for me, thank you. All right, uh, school districts adopting Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes, I, I'm happy to start, thank you, Annie. Um, I, um, as many of my colleagues on this committee, uh, am a part of the uh, MASC, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, mailing list, um, happened to um, notice a thread about uh, a number of school districts uh, coming forth, uh, indicating that they had changed the name of uh, their Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and it was not something that I was really aware of um, before this thread. And I was really surprised to see um, so many uh, districts in our area, as well as um, throughout uh, the state, um, passing it. Not only their, their, the, the school committees taking the lead on making that change, uh, but also in some instances, passing it townwide. Um, just a quick list um, uh, of, of the, uh, some of the towns, very, very diverse, small and large, urban, rural. Um, I'm gonna give you a sense of what those towns are. Acton, Boxborough, Amherst, Arlington, Brookline, Cambridge, Chelsea, Frontier, Grafton, Great Barrington, Harvard, Mashpee, Maynard, Melrose, Milton, Natick, Needham, Newton, North Middlesex, Northampton, Pittsfield, Sharon, Somerville, and Wayland. Um, of those schools, the cities that adopted this um, you know, citywide would include uh, Amherst, Arlington, Brookline, Cambridge, uh, Great Barrington, um, hang on one second, uh, and then Somerville, um, also Newton, sorry, uh, North Newton, Northampton, and Somerville. Just to give you a sense of um, this uh, is, is seeming to be something that is, um, um, is uh, gonna continue um, the state, I think the state has passed. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I don't think the state has done anything with respect to Indigenous people today, but 14 states around the nation have. Uh, and it's something that I wanted to just put out there for my school committee colleagues to think about um, as something to consider for our school committee um, passing the change of language to Indigenous people today. Thanks, Humara. Do we know um, from the select board perspective, like from a town perspective, whether this has been a discussion item or um, thought about in terms of a town-wide decision? I do not believe that it has been uh, discussed. Uh, perhaps it's something that the DEI committee has um, uh, contemplated. I'm not exactly sure about that either, um, but I always, um, I like to think that the school committee takes a leadership role on uh, matters related to um, uh, equity and inclusion. And um, so I'm happy to um, have us have that conversation and uh, influence um, some forward leaning uh, thoughts in those other uh, parts of our town. I would also add to that. Thank you so much, Humera, for sharing all that information from Mass Association of School Committees. And if this is something that the school committee would like to give further consideration to. It may also be nice to invite some of the student leaders at Hopkins who may have an interest in this as well. And I'm not suggesting then that the school committee has to wait if they wanna do something, but there may be student groups. I don't know, I could find that out, but there certainly there may be some student groups 
who um, also have an interest in this topic that may want to talk with the school committee and or partner with the school committee on recommendations. I don't know that, but I'd be happy to find that out. Although um, that would bring us a little bit closer to the fall, most likely. I don't, I think they're thinking on getting out of school right now, but. So and yeah, I, I, I would love to hear from the students and their perspectives on that. I'm just trying to think, what, what is this? I understand it's a, a statement, but it just re realistically, we would, when we talk about that holiday, we would just change, talk about it in a different way. It's an educational opportunity to talk about what that really means, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely would be interested in talking about this further. Yeah, I agree. Me too, I'm in support. Absolutely. I um, can, just to get a sense of, I can uh, reach out, not not this week, Hawkins is a little busy this week, but I can reach out next week too. I don't want to deviate that, their attention, uh, divert their attention rather from graduation, but um, I can certainly reach out to Ms. Camuso and find out which advisors may have had these conversations. Students may have raised this conversation. I think I've seen it as a statement in the hallway on the walls of Hopkins, which is also what's making me think about this. So um, certainly I can find out. And I know that the um, students always appreciate it when the school committee partners with them around leading the district, whether it's changing, you know, updating the dress code or um, some of our previous uh, graduation robes and things like that. The students have always appreciated doing some of this work with the school committee. Annie, it might be interesting to hear what your um, superintendent group, uh, whether they're talking about this at all as well. You have a list server. Uh, yeah, I can certainly find that out. Curious. And I appreciate, Humara, you pulling together the, the districts and the, the background on that. I missed that on the MASC listserv, so glad you picked up on that. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, it's... Um, I think it's a welcomed change in these um, communities where the conversation has been has been occurring, and I think it would be a, a really positive thing for Hadley. Great, thank you. Okay, next uh, we have some job descriptions and some roles. So we have special education administrator search and job description first. Annie. So what we are hoping we have the position posted. Um, and there were just um, some changes. This has been reviewed by the school committee's attorney and by the Dupre Law Office's the um, job description. There aren't significant changes from uh, the previous job description, except the previous job description uh, did indicate that the director of special education would um, essentially be the superintendent's designee in the superintendent's absence. And that was called out in the job description. So we have changed that um, because we haven't yet hired somebody for this position. Um, and then the timeline is, as I said, it, the job position has been posted on school spring. The deadline for applications is June 1st. Um, we will be screening applications June 2nd, 3rd and 4th. Um, and during the week of June 7th, contacting semifinalists or the people who would be granted an initial interview to schedule interviews and assign a performance task. And the screening committee will be the principals, the superintendent, and a liaison that I would request that um, I would uh, designate. And the reason I'm saying that is, as you know, if the school committee chair designates a liaison, then um, that subjects all meetings that that liaison participates in to, to open meeting law. And it's not that we don't want to be transparent, but we don't want to be caught with a problem with posting and having to cancel meetings. Um, so uh, I do know that uh, Tara Brueger has in the past assisted us here. And I know that she's very familiar with our special education programs. Um, and she, you know, Tara can certainly speak to what other, what other um, experiences she might bring to um, assisting us again. But the screening committee, the principals, the superintendent and the liaison from the school committee, that's just reviewing paper. Um, and then 
the interview committee. Uh, we've asked folks who are interested from Unit A, which are all of our credentialed professionals um, from Unit D. Um, so we're looking for, in the case of the first interviews, um, one principal, superintendent, a Unit A member from Hopkins Academy and from Hadley Elementary School and uh, an educational support professional. And then from that group, we would narrow that group down and bring finalists for another interview, another performance task. And the finalist committee, we're recommending superintendent, the school committee liaison and um, a building principal. And these would be the folks that were recommended by the interview committee. The initial interviews to take place the week of June 15th. The final interviews, finalists, uh, the week of June 21st. And then to bring the candidate before the school committee to approve and finalize the appointment. So that is the proposed timeline. Got it. So do you need the, um, uh, the school committee liaison to be appointed tonight? So I am recommending, if Tara is interested, I am recommending, it, unless there's any objection from the school committee, I would like to appoint Tara, but Tara, I'll certainly let you speak to that. Um, yeah, I would be very interested and I would like to. I've served on um, past interviews um, with special education um, and I um, did partake in the CPAC um, and leading up the seed pack for a while prior to coming on to school committee. And I do have personal experience um, in the special education department. So unless somebody has a really big objection, um, I, would, I would like to take part in the process. No objection. I am thankful that you have the time and uh, interest and are willing to do it. We're happy to have you do it. Tara, you are most qualified, like the most qualified of all of us to, um, on all matters related to special education, I would assert. So I'm really happy to hear that you are willing to invest the time in this. And thank you, Tara. And I noticed that I don't have for an action item the approval of this job description, but because I did say to you that I did change that language and it was reviewed by the attorney about the designee, um, I would ask if the school committee would be willing to approve it just so everything is squared away and that the existing job description is approved by the school committee. Got it. Is there a motion to approve the job description for the administrator for special education and student services? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Um, next job description we have is district cook job description. Yes. So and thank you. Yes, thank you so much to Mrs. Zach, Diane Zach. Um, she is recommending a reorganization of food service, and currently we have two head cooks, one in each building. Um, each receives a stipend. One of our uh, our head cook at Hadley Elementary School is retiring this year, and. Um, Ms. Zach has recommended that we have a food services director and we have a district cook. That's what she would like. And, and then maintain, so we would not fill the head cook position at Hadley Elementary. We would have a district cook that's responsible for ensuring that both sites are following all the meals, assisting Diane. And then the prep and line staff, that configuration would not change. All of those positions and hours would remain the same. Diane believes that this, this organization will allow the food services department to be more effective and more efficient, will present the opportunity for them to serve hot breakfast on occasion, something that students are interested in and have asked for. And in doing this, it will save the town, um, potentially save the town one benefits package um, because we would have one district cook rather than um, and not hire the person who's not replaced the position that is leaving Hadley Elementary School. So Ms. Zach put together the job description and we had the attorney review the job description. Um, and that's uh, what you have for approval this evening. Great, appreciate the, um, 
the thought Diane put into it and the efficiencies that can be gained. She knows it best. So um, any questions or comments on this one? Okay, is there a motion to approve the job description for Hadley District Cook? Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right, and then we have one more um, instructional technology specialist teacher job. Correct. So in 2012, I think halfway through, no, I take that back, halfway through 2013, I started in 2014. So in about October of 2013, Humera probably remembers this, um, after the town so graciously invested a tremendous amount of money in upgrading the technology for our schools in our district. The school committee created two stipended positions, a technology coach in each building and a technology integration specialist. And there is some, when you look at the job descriptions, there, there is a, a considerable degree of overlap in those positions because they all three of those positions really focus on coaching teachers, consulting with teachers, and providing professional development and resources. At the outset, that was incredibly important. As you know, I believe that the Warren article, I think you invested in one full swoop about $150,000 and there have been additional investments since. And it was a tremendous learning curve. Again, this predates me by about six to eight months. It's a huge learning curve. And since then, uh, Maureen Tumenis, who's been uh, the instructional technology specialist, has done a wonderful job. And she really, with the support of Helping Hearts and other uh, great generous groups in the, in the community, she built up our STEAM lab, the Science, Tech, Engineering, Arts, Mathematics lab, um, has created a wonderful lab for students to engage in all kinds of hands-on learning and computer science, engineering, and digital literacy skills. Last year, pre-pandemic, we were awarded a Project Lead the Way grant. Um, and in addition to being awarded the Project Lead the Way grant, what we realize now is the district would benefit greatly from having this position not solely be about professional development and support to other teachers, but also to provide teaching to students. If we have, if this position is a 0.5 teaching position, um, what that means is that we could conceivably create additional time for grade level teachers to collaborate with one another. Um, so the job description that you have in front of you, also reviewed by the attorney, um, focuses on this position delivering the curriculum and instruction for Project Lead the Way, that's not year long, those are 10 week modules, then teaching children digital literacy and computer science skills. It's a 0.5 position still, but rather than just supporting adults, which is incredibly important, there's a big focus on working directly with children. Um, and so that is what I'm asking the school committee to approve this evening um, and certainly our current uh, instructional technology specialist is qualified for the position. And if they're interested in the position, would certainly this is, this is the job that they would fill, but that's, that's the individual would need to decide if this is a position that they wanted. And you mentioned the Project Lead the Way um, grant is 10 week modules. So would it be understood by the person filling this position kind of what the longevity is? I mean, a grant isn't guaranteed. Um, yeah, how would that work? Yeah, I'm not, I wasn't very clear then. So because the position, this would replace an existing position. The person in the existing position is qualified to fill this position. It's essentially a right of first refusal. It's just saying we need to, we've had that position for, if I just finished seven years, you've had that position for almost eight years, as well as technology coaches. My recommendation is that, um, that this is a teaching position now, that you maintain two tech coaches and you, so it's funded in the operating budget. It is not grant dependent. The grant just is about 
curriculum. It's about part of what we would be teaching, but only 10 weeks and the remaining, it's a 0.5 position, so half a week each week, but the remaining time would be about integrating instruction with what's happening in regular classrooms. So connecting to what's being taught in um, the grade level classrooms and teaching uh, computer science and digital literacy for which there is a framework and there are standards. Got it. I really um, think this is a good move to make. At the time that we, you know, eight years ago when we were just getting started, it made sense to have that strategy of part time, you know, teachers, someone within the teaching body who could uh, help their peers. Um, and we've come such a long way since then, not only just our fluency in technology at both schools, but also going through a pandemic that required everyone to have a crash course and utilizing uh, technology um, and our one-to-one -one computing. Um, so it, it just seems to make a lot of sense. My only question is uh, that the currently the halftime uh, technology integrationist serves one school, Hadley Elementary School. Will the new full time position serve both schools? So it's still a halftime position, and it would start. It's still a halftime position, Humera. So it's exactly the same in terms of time and budget impact, and it would be focused on Hadley Elementary School. Now that doesn't mean that going forward, because Project Lead the Way, the grant that we have is through grade six, I wanna say. I mean, technically they call middle school starting in grade six, but it's for the elementary school. But personally, I would like to see the district be a project lead the way district so that these modules and this learning goes all the way through 12th grade, which it does. And then we could look at in future budget cycles, expanding the position to do something similar at Hopkins Academy. Great. Sounds good. Okay, you would just need to approve the job description in that place. All right. In that case. Is there a motion to approve the job description for instructional technology specialist teacher? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, excellent. Um, finally, we have the review of public health data. So I'm going to speak to this, if that's okay, because I didn't pull the weekly dashboard up, but I assure you, I almost have it memorized here. So we're down definitely in what used to be called in our old world, that yellow, right? We only, the remember our green, yellow, orange, red back in August had to do with uh, Harvard's recommendations and green was less than one in terms of average daily incidence rate per 100,000. And uh, between one to nine would be yellow. Hampshire County rates have been steadily dropping. Um, every single week we see that they're coming down, both in terms of average daily incidence and in terms of testing positivity, which I believe the last time I updated it, it was about 0.27%, 0.27. It was very low and it had come down from the previous week. And the average daily incidence rate had also <laughs> come down. Um, the best news, which isn't on that graph, I think in general in Massachusetts and the Northeast, it's wonderful that New England is leading the way in vaccinations across the entire country. And I believe Massachusetts is fourth in the nation. I think maybe May, New Hampshire, Vermont might be ahead of us, some other New England states, but we're talking only by like less than a percent. I mean, New England is all so close in terms of the percentage of population fully vaccinated. And that is really... Um, a tremendous game changer as the public might see in every weekly newsletter. I um, try to provide people with information on how they can get vaccines. And we're having a vaccine clinic this Friday at Hopkins Academy for students who are eligible. So Hadley Public School students ages 12 and up who would like to uh, get vaccinated. If you did not see that in the weekly newsletter, um, certainly you can email me directly and I will gladly provide you with any parent or family with that information. So good news in the county, um, good news uh, certainly in our district. We have a uh, the vast majority of our faculty and staff are fully vaccinated. Um, we have recently, I think it's worthwhile because parents are probably thinking, goodness gracious, you sound so upbeat and yet I got three emails from you last week about positive cases. So um, 
we did see uh, kind of a combination of um, uh, community, uh, uh, kind of what appears to be a localized community outbreak. Um, and um, what I really appreciate is that this had to do with a community, um, uh, kind of a community sports organization. And I have to say, I think that what worked, what showed, what works so well, I'm, I'm very sad that anybody is uh, tested positive for COVID and has to deal with that physical distress and that stress. But essentially through pool testing, we were able to pick up an asymptomatic positive. And then when, when we can do that and community organizations that also are connected to the asymptomatic, po asymptomatic positive take all the right steps, all the right community health measures, that's what stops massive community transmission. So I am sad that anybody is ill, but I do wanna say it is a testament, a testimony to uh, a testament to the system working, right? So, what pool testing can do, and I also strongly encourage families to consider signing up for pool testing, and I expect that we will continue doing this in the fall. Is it allows us to identify folks that otherwise wouldn't be identified, right? Asymptomatic positive people, and then to identify all of the close contacts for those people, and to limit the likelihood that we have. Um, greater spread. So that's what uh, happened this past week. And of course, we'll get our pool testing results uh, from this week, probably tomorrow. Yeah, I appreciate the framing, Annie. It's good to know that um, what you had hoped would, would work seems to have worked <laughs> in terms of an initial alert. And, a, and it sounds like really great, um, responsible communication from the other organization. And I'm glad um, that, that those things came together. Yeah, they did perfectly. And I would say I've, I've heard, and I understand this. I sometimes I hear people say, ah, oh, it's all this testing. This is what the problem is. But I just need people to remember that, um, the testing doesn't make people positive, right? The testing identifies people who are positive that without the testing, they would just be interacting with others. Um, it can feel like, wow, if the school weren't doing that testing, we wouldn't have all this disruption. And sometimes people even say to me, it just feels like it was safer before all this testing. And what I've said is it wasn't safer. We might've been ignorant, but we certainly weren't safer. And the safety comes from knowing, right? And then taking the appropriate action. So, and I appreciate all the community support um, in when, when this happens. Great, great. If I may, I just wanna also um, express condolences on um, the part of the school committee to the Ring family. Scott Ring um, is, um, was such an incredible supporter of the boosters and the, uh, the schools. Um, his four daughters went through our school, school system and his passing due to this terrible disease is um, something that, um, just breaks um, so many community members' hearts. Um, I wanna urge people to contribute to the fund for um, the families, the medical expenses that the family has incurred. Um, and you can find that by just searching for help for the Ring family on GoFundMe or just contact me if you're interested. I will uh, share with you that information. Um, but um, I, 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 I'm not close friends with the family, but it really struck me when I read a post from Carrie Ring um, a couple of weeks back when she was pleading with community members to consider getting vaccinated because, um, you know, just asynchronous, uh, as, um, symptomatic or symptomatic cases in the community, just touching that one person um, who might catch it and not have a fate like this is not worth it to me and, and I think to us. Um, so I urge everyone to consider um, that to be the case. I'm really heartened that school um, kids between 12 and 15 can now get vaccinated. Both my youngest have gotten their first shot. Um, so thank you for hosting that clinic. And I urge others to, um, to look into that. 
Thank you for um, mentioning the Ring family, Humara. Thank you very much. Our hearts do go out to them and I appreciate you bringing that up. And I just wanna make sure folks give credit where credit is due. Emma Dragon, no surprise, superhero superstar is the one that's bringing the vaccine clinic to Hadley. I have one quick question um, unrelated to the vaccine, um, but to um, pool testing, how does that work over the summer? Are, are we able to just pause the program and then potentially start it up again in the fall? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes, thank you, Humara, for um, our condolences to the Ring family. I think we, we all have, um, uh, are thankful for being able to um, hear from them and understand where they are. But I, I know that I want them to know that we are all thinking about you and have you in our thoughts and in our prayers. All right. Um, we moved the first item reorganization. I think that was our last item, Annie, before we move into reports. All right. So we'll move then into reorganization of the committee. Uh, this is something we do annually. We talked about this last meeting, um, typically right after uh, election. Um, we established uh, the chair, the vice chair, and then we have subcommittees um, for which we each give different reports for the various functions that we um, serve on either individually or, or as, as two of us. And those subcommittees include policy subcommittee, finance subcommittee, the capital planning, subcommittee, um, the collaborative uh, representative, and then of course our warrants and our payroll signees, which we need, <clears throat> excuse me, we need two people to do that. Uh, thankfully those are digital signers at this point uh, in time. We no longer need to come in and flip through all of this stuff. Uh, physically, we can do it online. So we'll um, start that process. Uh, First election of chairperson, um, this is a nomination process. I, I have really enjoyed serving as the chair for uh, this school committee for a number of years. I've learned so much um, and I really enjoy working with all of you. Um, I would like to nominate Humera to serve in this role uh, for the coming year. Um, I, I want to mention that I'm coming into, this is the last year of my current three-year term and I do not intend to rerun um, as I, my child is exiting the Hopkins Hadley system and I would welcome uh, in the future additional participation from uh, parents and family members and other town residents who would be welcome to uh, participate in this process that is so valuable. So with that in my last year, I, I would love to nominate Humera to serve as our uh, chairperson. I don't know if I can, but I would love to second it. I think that Humera, you bring great perspective and great leadership um, and diligence to the committee. And I, I would appreciate you in that role. But I, I don't know if anybody else has anything before I. <laughs> I would be remiss without saying, I, I, um, Humera, I have valued your input over the years. You've been on here longer than I have, longer than all of us. Um, and you have worked um, so hard, so diligently and effectively, um, often in the background. And I really appreciate that about you. I think um, none of us do this for, surely not for the pay and surely not for the accolades, um, but I think that you're, you know, you have continuously just um, furthered uh, initiatives that uh, and delivered on those results. And so um, as to qualifications, as Tara was saying, absolutely, I, I just, I would feel so confident and, and um, I would welcome having, seeing you in that role. I just wanna say one more thing too, Heather, thank you for being in that role for the past few years because you did step in so beautifully and you've been an amazing leader and communicative um, and keeping us on track and um, just in general, keeping the, the meetings running and, and everything. I, I've lost my words, but thank you for your Thanks, time. Tara. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I, I recommend this 
being part of this uh, committee to anyone. If anyone is watching this, and I, I don't know <laughs> if folks watch this after the fact, but um, I, you know, this is such a valuable uh, process committee. I, I have welcomed our dialogues. I have, you know, been honored to be your your chair for the years that I have, and really look, do look forward to it. Um, I've loved the conversations with all of you, and. I, I really value that we are all professionals and treat each other as professionals. And we may not always agree, uh, and that's fine. You know, actually, that's welcomed. I love that we are able to dialogue through where we aren't all in agreement and really come to a realization of where we may need to be. Um, and I've seen folks uh, change throughout this process. I myself have changed throughout this process. So I thank you all for that. All right, well, sounds like um, I've made a motion and Tara has seconded it. So uh, may we vote on that? All in, uh, so before, motion. Before motion. voting, I just wanna make sure that Paul and Ethan, you are on board with this nomination. Oh, I think it'd be great. I, I, um, if if uh, everyone on this team is deserving and capable and uh, I would get behind any one of you as the chair, um, and I, I just want to make sure that there's that that you all are good or if, if anyone is interested in taking that role, I'd be happy to throw my support behind you as well. Um, this, I want to make sure that we are all all into this decision. I think it'd be great, Humara, if you if you're willing to do it. You, yeah, I think you'd serve it. You do a very, very good job. I mean, you, you're clearly very engaged on these issues. It's just, I know it's a big ask. So, um, you know, as we go through the other ones, the vice chair, I've been serving as vice chair. Heather, you've been doing it so competently. I don't think I've any, done anything as in the vice chair role. So whomever takes over that vice chair role, whether it's me, you know, just know that we're a team and we can support you. Sounds great to me. Let's do it. <laughs> great, thank you. I accept the nomination if that's required at all. Yeah. Thanks, Yumara. Thank you. All right, Vice Chair slash Secretary. Um, let's see. So yes, Paul, you are currently in this role. I, I would nominate you to continue serving in this role. Seeing that I don't exactly do much for it, I'm happy to continue not doing much for it. So. Uh, it's, I, I mean, I, you know, in all seriousness, the capital planning subcommittee is the one that I put more time into. So again, Heather, you've really done a good job. Annie takes the notes, the secretary. And, and so um, I'm happy to continue serving at that role. So basically, I'll be your backup, Mira. If you're out, I'll, I'll chair the meetings. Great. Thank you, Paul. Sure. But again, if, if somebody else wants to step up and do that, I'm happy to, to step aside as well. If you're happy to stay in that role, Paul, I'm happy to okay. say thank you both. I co-sign that. That works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next, we have our policy subcommittee. Uh, so currently on the policy subcommittee are Humera and Tara, correct? And do you want to tell us a little bit about what the policy subcommittee does? You just met. We did. And, you know, we had an exhaustive review of the entire policy manual a few years back now. And rather than saving it to uh, one big project, we decided that we would take a little bit, uh, a piece at a time, and just make sure that we were current on all uh, of our policy manual sections. And as urgent things came up, uh, then we would, you know, add that to the mix as well. So generally, it's half an hour dovetailing an existing meeting. So you're not taking additional time out and meeting in person. These Zoom meetings right before or after have made it really easy. I would, I would imagine that that would continue. I'm happy, I don't wanna hog certainly, but I'm happy to continue on it. Um, it uh, I, I enjoy doing the policy meetings um, and I do feel like, you know, I maybe haven't been able to put, um, my weight in on it this past year, we did stop for quite some time because COVID took, um, took a lot of our time and effort. Um, so we didn't, we didn't meet as frequently as, as we normally would. Um, I'm happy to continue it. I like it. I'd love to continue it, but if somebody else really 
really wants it, then I'm, I'm happy to step aside too. I'd also like to say that uh, that is a subcommittee role that I have valued. I didn't always value it. I was part of the, the, the group that had done that big review that one year. Oh my gosh, that nearly killed us. But, um, but I really do view um, the, the review of policies as a key way to think about um, how we look at our, how, uh, our structural systems. And uh, I really appreciate this time around, seeing it anew with those fresh eyes. So I wouldn't mind staying in that role. I would be happy to have you both continue in that role. Ethan, Paul, that sounds good to you. Sounds good to me. Yeah, me too. All right, thank you both. And I also, I served in this role um, a few years back and I really enjoyed it. And uh, it was interesting from you know the legal perspective to get some of those updates, but then at the time we had a changing landscape with you know uh, legalization of marijuana and having to revisit some of the substance abuse and all of those kinds of things. So it was interesting uh, looking at the policies through the light of some of the current events and things changing in our state. All right, next, um, finance committee. So Ethan, you currently serve on that. Um, I know I used to, I don't think I still do because Ethan, you've, you've attended those meetings. Um, typically finance committee uh, serves with the, what they call the tri-board, which is the, the um, select board and the finance committee and the school committee um, representatives. We try not to have more than uh, two of us at those tri-board meetings. Actually, I think maybe it's just one. Annie, I, I can't remember. Usually, well, yeah, a quorum yeah. would be three, but Ethan, Ethan is our, he's a regular. <laughs> <laughs> a regular, that's, yep. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to stay on it. Happy to, to continue uh, going to the tri-board meetings. Never a dull moment. I'm good with that. Unless somebody yeah, wants it. If you ever need a backup or you need to reach out to somebody, I'm always happy to assist if you can't make something, but I'm absolutely happy to have you stay on. Sounds good. Great, thank you, Ethan. All right, next we have uh, appointment of capital planning subcommittee. Uh, I believe, Paul, this has been you uh, in the role of, especially with the Fields Project as being part of that. And I'm happy to continue with that role. Folks are interested. I know we just talked to Carlos and um, Carlos is to do is to start talking about the phase two of the field. So it makes sense that I'm working on that to be on the capital planning committee as well. And then phase three with the lights, right? Like that's just, you know, that's... <laughs> We talked about lights, a million dollars and lots of grief by the neighbors later, maybe. Yeah. Wouldn't be on all the time. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I'd be happy to have you continue to serve in that role, Paul. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, then the appointment of the collaborative representative, Humera, you have served in this role uh, for a couple of years and it's... Um, I don't know if you want to describe the collaborative and their services. Yes, um, the collaborative um, is a um, uh, comprised of member districts in the area who um, uh, are. Um, what's the best way to describe this? It's a state legislated thing. So a member of uh, each school committee uh, appoints a member to the collaborative board. Um, so the board has some um, 20 to 30 people representing all the member districts that it serves. That number is probably way inflated. But I can tell you that the CES uh, role has been really interesting to learn from other districts. What are the challenges that they're facing? And also to see some of the um, services that uh, member districts have been utilizing. Hadley has enjoyed um, being able to utilize a number of those shared services 
you know, when you, when you need a, a, a part-time or less than part-time occupational therapist or speech therapist, you're able to go to CES and, and um, utilize those services rather than having to hire your own. Um, and they provide a number of different trainings and um, topics that are timely and uh, the kind that you know, you can't necessarily afford to get the leading expert on um, digital literacy or, um, uh, or on being able to tell the difference um, in, in um, news sources as, as was the question back in 2016 or 2017. So as a, a board member, you not only get to see and understand what kinds of services we can enjoy, but you can also influence how CES thinks about bringing on additional services, training and staff to serve our member districts. Um, so I would strongly urge you to, I, I've really enjoyed the role. I am partly thinking like, maybe I should hold on to it, but realistically as, as a chairperson, I imagine that I'll be adding onto my role a number of responsibilities that I haven't had. So I'm, um, willing to part with it for anyone who'd like to enjoy that. I'm happy to take on that role if, unless there's somebody who uh, really wants it. I've been very intrigued by this um, for years and um, definitely very, uh, it's, it's always insightful when they come and present uh, about their services. And it seems like every time we get some new uh, either you know, idea out of it, service out of it, or uh, kind of we build on that. So Happy to do it unless somebody else would like the role. Um, I um, am supportive of you doing it. And seeing as you've just announced this is your last year, I think this is a good opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, I'm interested in the future, um, but I, you know, where we're at right now, I think it's, it's only fair and right that they, that you step into that role. And in the future, I'll have my opportunity. I've got more years. I appreciate that, Tara. Okay. I think you're great at that role, Heather. And um, those, the meetings are by Zoom. Super, you know, I, I imagine that they'll stay that way. So I, yes, I, I see you as a good fit for that role. Great, thank you. Well, I, and I, I would like to stay involved on one of these subcommittees. So I appreciate that. All right, um, signing bills for payroll. Uh, who currently is the primary and who's the alternate for that? I'm primary. Tara is the primary and Ethan is the alternate. Yes, I have had to do nothing. <laughs> well, I've been doing it for five years now, <laughs> Ethan. So wow. if, if you'd like to take it on, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to keep it if nobody wants it, but I'm also very happy to pass the torch if anybody would like it. And it's just as Heather said, um, Chris sends everything electronically and sometimes you'll get five and sometimes you will literally get 25 emails from Chris saying, please sign these. Um, and I do my best to try to be pr pretty timely in them, getting them done um, within a day or two. Um, and he'll send you reminders if you don't. Um, but I'm happy to pass it along to anybody or willing to keep it if nobody wants it. Either way is fine by me. I'm happy to step in and help. I mean, whether primary or alternate, five years is long enough. I think you paid your dues, Tara. No, Tara. Yeah, so. I, it's not for me to suggest the school committee do anything. I would say it might be, if Ethan, if you have an interest, certainly going to the tri board, it's a logical place to review the warrants because what you're doing is reviewing every single expense that the school department has and every bill that we pay. It's riveting. As Tara would point out, Ethan, you want to swap and you be the prime? That I, I was going to say, I'm happy to 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 play that role for her and and take that off Tara's plate. She's done a great job. I'm happy to have Paul as the alternate. If he'd yeah. Like. Yeah, I'll do that. That's fine. Paul, it's a great role. That sounds good. And I know Humera, you may need to step in on a couple of things too. I know Chris often gets me things that need to be reviewed or signed or whatever. Um, so those will come to you. Great. Okay, well, I think we've gone through then all of the reorg pieces. Uh, let's go to school committee reports. Collaborative. 
And yeah. actually, I should ask Annie, should I turn it over to Humera? Uh, technically, yes. You have a new chair. There you go, yeah, Humera. The, the gavel is yours. <laughs> yes. Passing oh, I, the, the virtual torch. Okay. And uh, what that really means is that you might have to create a breakout room at the end of this, but you know how to do that. That's right. All yours. <laughs> We're on 6A. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 6A. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I um, may make missteps. And so, you know, mentor me in real time, Heather and Annie, in terms of how I uh, go through this. But um, 6A, CES uh, uh, reports, and that's me, Bessie Um This last CES um, uh, th week was a very important one as we interviewed two finalists for the CES executive director role. And they were both extremely qualified uh, candidates. One is serving in the interim role today and has for the last several months. She had been a previous employee at uh, CES. Um, and so she was coming back after serving as, I believe, a principal um, in a, an area school. And um, uh, the um, other was also a very highly qualified candidate. Um, it was a very difficult decision. We had um, town meetings to review, video, video um, town meetings to review. We had their entry plans to review. And then we spent... Um, the better part of an hour interviewing them as a board. And I'm glad to say that we came out of that with a decision. Um, and um, the new board member is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Todd Gazda. Um, and I think that he's going to be spot on for this role. Um, there was a lot of excitement about what he brings to the table. And if you have an interest, I'm happy to um, see what materials are available for publicly sharing with my school committee colleagues. But um, that's the big news is that CES has a new executive director and um, I believe they will begin imminently. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, the next item on the agenda is 6B and that is finance, Ethan. Not, not a whole lot to, to update on finance, except that we did get a budget passed um, for the town at the, at the annual town meeting. And um, the schools did get a very nice shout out from the select board um, due to us being able to submit a level funded budget. Um, so I think they were very happy because that obviously helped them with their budget work this year. So it was nice to, to hear them kind of show a little bit of appreciation. Well, what a nice acknowledgement. And I just want to shout out to um, Annie for her careful stewardship of that finance role and, um, and helping us present that um, level budget and also to our finance and capital liaisons for helping make that possible. I think it's a real testament to the last two, three years. Um, and so in the next item, 6C, policy. So I'll speak to that. So we just had one, um, one small, see, uh, small, small, see, small policy to review. Um, so the preferred vocational school, um, and it's my understanding that this is common practice amongst districts that have a preferred um, vocational um, program that they use. And so the suggestion that was put in place by the um, school attorney is that we designate um, as a district, the Smith vocational as our um, preferred vocational school. Um, and, um, there's a limited exception on where that would, um, that would not be the, um, preferred schools if, um, a student were look to look into, um, um, an area of, um, area or career or shop class um, that is not available at Smith Folk, then they would be able to um, look into alternatives. Otherwise, that would essentially um, leave the superintendent um, at her discretion um, to um, approve in that case if the shop were not available or whatnot. Um, otherwise, this would be our preferred um, vocational school. And again, this, this was reviewed by the attorney and came at their recommendation as well. So this is something that we don't currently have in place that we'd be looking to adopt. 
Great. This is a new new policy entirely. Yes, it is a new and apparently widely adopted in um, throughout Massachusetts. Um, so not uh, new in general, but something that we haven't had. Um, and is it correct, Annie, that this is not necessarily up for a first reading that you'd like us to vote on this tonight? Yeah, because um, by waiting, so by not having a school, and Sarah, thank you for that inter introduction. Just one little point of clarity. The attorney recommends the school committee have a preferred school. Does not matter to the attorney which one it is. Does not have a preference as to which school it is. When you don't have one, students can go anywhere and the school department is responsible not only for the tuition, which typically are comparable, but for transportation. Um, and so if you wait to adopt the policy, if you have students who say, well, I'd like to go to Pathfinder, I'd like to go to Franklin, I'd like to go to Smith, um, not only is it the tuitions, but we have to provide transportation to all of those places. So there could be a time in the future that the school committee could determine they wanna revisit the policy, but there really is no um, upside to waiting on adopting the policy because until such time as you have designated a preferred school, then any school that a, a student elects, not only would it be the tuition, but it's also the transportation that has to be paid for. So that's helpful. I was curious why the, the harsh language, I mean, I see the, the last sentence a little bit frank, but basically what it's saying is, the superintendent can disapprove if they have not applied to Smith Folk. Doesn't say they have to go to Smith Folk because they could go to those. They could apply to Smith Folk, get in, but go to those other ones and get in, and that we would still have to pay for them to get there. Now, at that around. point, so what would happen in that in that case if a student applied to a vocational school other than the designated or preferred vocational school? The student applied to another vocational school. Um, by disapproving the application, what it means is that the district would say, no, we provide transportation and pay tuition to this vocational school over here and they offer that shop. Now what students sometimes can do and have done in Western Massachusetts where there are not typically not wait lists for vocational schools and we have declining enrollment is that if they're, they're really their heart is set on going to a different school. Majority of our families do just choose Smith Folk naturally, which is probably why you've never designated anything. But if a student really wanted to go elsewhere, um, they could apply under school choice. And the vocational school is not going to get the non-resident vocational tuition, which is more around, let's say $20,000 per tuition. They're not going to get that. They would get school choice, $5,000. They wouldn't get, if, if Smith Volk offered the exact, offered the same shop, Smith Volk doesn't offer the shop, then the school district not only must pay the tuition, but also provide the transportation. If it's a shop that is not offered. Yeah, I understand. So a student applies to Smith Volk, gets yeah. in, applies to one of these other vocational, gets in, decides mm -hmm. to go to the other one. Under what grounds? And the, the shop, and the yeah. shop that the student has selected is offered at Smith Folk. Then this policy says, I would dis disapprove the application. Now, if that, let's say they went, to, they went to go to Pathfinder. That's not what it says though. It says if the student does not apply, they get apply. It doesn't say they're obligated to go. Right? I guess if, a student, if a student does not apply to Smith Folk, the superintendent may disapprove. So they apply to Smith. Folk right. So they apply to both. I'm sorry. Then they, it's still Smith Folk is a preferred vocational school. It's a preferred vocational school. If they're going to another vocational school, they're only, the reason that it matters is that they're going to that other school via school choice. So that vocational school would have to accept students under school choice. Many vocational schools do. No, I get it. It's just, there's, is there something magical about preferred? that has a legal definition. If yeah, once you legal, designate the school, yes. Then and they're saying, obligated to go, if they get into multiple vocational schools, including Smith Oak, they are obligated to go if they want to be, if they want us to pay non-resident tuition. They could go through school choice, but then we are not obligated to pay non-resident tuition. Correct. Is that what this? Correct. Okay, it so just doesn't read like that. If this is a legal legalese to try to protect us from that, 
And it's, it, ostensibly, I'm assuming a lawyer wrote it. It just doesn't seem Yeah, the lawyer did write it. Yeah. Because it just says they have to apply. So the policy itself was written by the school attorney. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Paul, I'm, I'm seeing it the way you are too, that uh, it just says, you gotta apply to Smith first before anything else. And if you don't, then you could disapprove. So, but it doesn't say anything about acceptance. So that, that, that might warrant a follow-up. I mean, it doesn't even say you have to apply first. You can apply to five of them. And as long as you apply, apply to- It does say um, you have to apply to Smith before applying to any other vocational school. So at least, so I read that as you gotta, you gotta do Smith first. However, that doesn't, it doesn't say anything about oh, direct, yeah. acceptance, which I, I agree with you, Paul, but right. that, that's kind of left ambiguous here. But I mean, so, I get the point that we're trying to we're trying to protect to say that we support kids going to, to vocational schools. Thank you, Heather. Right before applying to other, they have to apply there. Um, yeah. It kind of okay. reads like Annie, you could, you know, superintendent can only say no if the student didn't happen to apply to Smith first. That that's how I read it. And I was yeah. But it's a little more than that, right? Sounds like that. When a school committee designates a vocational school, then the expectation is that if the town is paying, or in this case, the school department is paying the tuition and providing the transportation for said vocational school, that that's where they would go. Um, and what it protects the school committee from is again, not that we're trying to interfere. Smith does not offer the shop, then they would go, then they go wherever the shop is offered. But in the if you don't designate, so you can have students who are going to Smith Folk, going to Franklin County Tech, going to Pathfinder, going to Dean potentially. You have to provide transportation for every single one of those destinations. This is what I would recommend. What, if, um, if I may, what uh, I, under, I think we all understand what the spirit of this policy is and what it's trying to avoid. And in light of that, the language may be clunky and perhaps could use another set of eyes based on this possible alternate uh, way of viewing it. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that we consider passing it tonight as is um, on, with the spirit that uh, if anyone were to apply to a different vocational as far as Pathfinder or Franklin or you know even farther, that we would be on the hook for busing for those situations, unless we pass something tonight. Um, and that maybe any, you could review it with Fred um, and just clarify the language, uh, because if we need to confer as a policy committee and refine and bring it back to us, we can fix it. Does that make sense? Before we do that, it does make sense. I, I do have a question though, just about immediate impact. So yep. it is, application an annual process and would we have current students that are impacted by this like is it oh, because prior because you don't have a policy so there's nothing to uh to you, you don't have a you don't have a policy right now so anybody who's applied to another voc school and had that application approved um prior to you designating one then they continue in that vocational school Okay, I but just we're not it's going forward. I wasn't sure of like what if there are literally like active applications going on now for the upcoming academic year, I would hate for this to be confusing for anyone. Yeah, so active and approved and it would not affect any approved application. Okay. Thank you. Great, so um, do I hear a motion to approve this uh, preferred vocational school policy? Yes, Second. Second. <laughs> Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 And so this will come back to us then for updated language that maybe is- Or I will better explain why she feels strongly that the language should be what it is. So she, she writes the policies for school districts on 
on uh, designating vocational schools. So great. Thank sure. you. I mean, so you simply would say if a student gets into Smith Folk and decides not to go there, then right, then the superintendent may disapprove. So that their their choice. They've applied, they got in, and they choose not to go there. Well, then it's not our obligation to pay for their transfer. Yeah, I'll check yeah. in with her and come back. Great. Thank you, Annie. And the last item, 6D, fields and capital. Paul. Yeah, thank you. So I'll be quick. Well, every year for the last couple of years, we've applied for the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority for uh, redoing the uh, girls' locker room and Hopkins Academy and the vents, the AC, the HVAC system. We've been denied several times now and we were considering resubmitting. And frankly, I don't, as much as I, I think they're warranted to redo the, the girls' locker room, I don't think, we're just, the feedback we get is we're not very competitive, right? It's a very low priority national uh, in the state. Mm -hmm. And the HVAC system, to be honest, we've redone some of it with COVID funds. We're a victim of our own due diligence, right? We are uh, we keep our buildings up, even though from, they're from the 50s and the 60s, the Hopkins Academy is, we keep them up very well. And so I think from the MSBA's perspective, we're probably low on the priority. So what we're thinking about is not applying again this year, uh, considering taking a look and see what we might be able to do for next year, whether we target in on um, one or both of those or have a larger discussion and have this bigger conversation about how much we keep putting into this 50, 60, 70 year old building and whether a whole new building is a conversation to be had. And obviously that's a huge conversation. It's a very expensive conversation, but maybe, uh, you know, as you keep putting money into a used car and you have to decide at some point and you stop doing that, maybe it's time to have that conversation again. I know these are past conversations folks have gone through about having buildings or whether you regionalize with another uh, nearby school that's also, you know, might be, uh, of a similar or smaller size. So those are the kinds of big conversations I think we should start having, start engaging with at a small level and build up. But obviously that's not gonna happen in the next few weeks when these applications are due to MSBA by the end of June. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. I, um, I also appreciate the fact that you've tried. Sometimes the first time just, you know, uh, doesn't, doesn't work in the second and third, but if you're, getting the consistent feedback. We, we're learning from this. It, it's uh, clear that um, a different approach may be necessary. And this is a conversation that's come up before. Our buildings are really old. They could really use an update. Um, so whether we upgrade, you know, uh, wholly upgrade our building or look at new strategies, that's a strategic conversation that should be had. And um, I wonder, Annie, is that the kind of thing that we, might um, devote part of a retreat. We've had retreats in the past. I'm wondering what cycle are we on for retreats and whether it makes sense to have that strategic conversation at a retreat. I would say yes. And um, normally we've tried to do something to come together every year. And again, just this last, usually over the summer and this last summer, I mean, everything this year just revolved around trying to get buildings open and figuring out COVID-19. And I don't, I don't foresee that being an issue going forward, um, hopefully. So certainly um, that, and um, we've also talked about maybe having, how do we engage the community on some of the topics that are uh, a priority for the school committee and um, for other members of the community. So definitely we can do that. We can start thinking about an MSBA application, what we really want it to include going forward, how we need to reach out to people and um, engage stakeholders because some of you folks, I don't know, was anybody, well, Humira, Heather, I don't know if you were here for the elementary project. If you were, you know, it is a heavy, heavy lift. Not impossible, but it's a heavy lift. It, it's a, it requires a, a big communication plan. It was before my time, um, but I've seen other area school districts um, and, and heard other communities really struggle through that. It is a big lift. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, we would obviously um, be, have to be very thoughtful about whether we were willing to undertake that project. And certainly when I look at um, the Hopkins Academy School, I think, um, I, I think that it's one way or another, either, uh, either replacing and, and wholly updating or uh, or regionalizing it's 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 a decision point that we have to have to come to and and it would be a conversation that that the community would have to participate in um, any other uh, thoughts or comments from additional team members on this yeah, I have one. Um, I, I know I've always valued seeing that capital plan that is like the 10 year plan that kind of has um, major investments that we've talked through, but also the forecasting of when we think things are going to break um, based on their lifespan, you know, like buses and things like that. I would, I, I think it would be helpful to understand if there is such a thing for our facility to know, you know, kind of like, you know, the, the length of uh, how long a roof is supposed to last. You know how long certain systems are supposed to uh, be current or when they would need updating. That might be helpful to understand our roadmap of, you know, if that's the used car, kind of what's our um, service plan as we as we know it currently looking ahead. That's a really good point. Yeah, that's I would good, love yeah. having that be part of our retreat discussion. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, and now we're on item seven, announcements. Are there any announcements um, from the school committee members? As I say, I apologize. I'm gonna have to ring off pretty soon. Just a few minutes. I know we have a couple more items. Okay, um, I do have a quick announcement and that is that um, the um, organization, the, the initiative Hadley Learns is celebrating its one year anniversary. Um, by um, honoring George Floyd and others like him who have lost their lives uh, due to all the factors that influence how our society views safety. And so the theme of the next uh, two months, the summer series, June and July, uh, is justice and community safety. The first month in June, we'll look at history uh, to present um, and have some very interesting um, podcasts and articles to uh, read up on for that. Uh, to have a small community discussion on Zoom. And then the second is on um, looking forward. Um, what uh, both the police community as well as um, other um, uh, towns that are looking at public safety differently, what they're talking about and doing so that we are informed as a community about both of those um, different aspects. So check that out at hadleylearns.com. Okay. So I believe um, we have, um, we have uh, action items in item eight, approval of the minutes of April 26. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. And uh, approval of AP warrants for April 2021. Um, do I hear a motion? So moved. Second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All and abstain. Great, thank you, Heather. And approval of warrants for April, 2021. Uh, do I hear a motion? Motion to approve warrants. Okay. Second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Is this Excellent. the one where I abstain? Yep. This is, yes. Thank you, Paul. Um, we already approved the job description for mm -hmm. instructional technology specialist teacher. We already approved the policy and uh, approval of fiscal year 22 one year contract extension for. So UK. we need executive session and okay. then we need to come out and vote and open. Great. I think I, I apologize. I, I, I do need to run it. I, I don't know if folks heard my son had broke his hand the other day. Oh. And so there's some issue I got to attend to. Um, oh, no, no. Hey, Paul, I hope he feels better. Yeah. Well, we'll see the surgeon tomorrow. So uh, oh. hopefully you know, you might, yeah, right before graduation. Addy? So. Is this Addy? Oh dear. Yeah. Oh, well, wish him well for us. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I gotta run. Have a good night, folks. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Hey, Paul. Himara, I'm gonna make you the host so that you can make, I don't know how you wanna do this, but we just need to have a breakout room. Okay. 
Go ahead. Um, so it's us. I'm just going to make you the host. And then we come back to Hadley Media and our guest. Okay, great. So can I uh, have a motion to move into executive session? And I'll make this breakout room. Motion. Second. Okay, great. And any, is that all we need or do we need to? I'm sorry, uh, can you just read that? You're moving to go into executive session. Uh, Heather, you made the motion. Motion to move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and to reconvene an open session. Great. And do I hear a second? Second. And all in and favor. Our roll call vote, please. Roll call. Mm -hmm. uh, Klesh. Yes. Bruger. Yes. Percy. Yes. And uh, Fasidin, yes. Okay, great. And we will resume momentarily. I'm, uh, I've made a breakout room. All right. So we are back in open session um, after having an executive session. And um, I, um, I wonder if there's a motion to approve a 1.5% increase for the fiscal year 22 one year contract extension with UPSEU. So moved. So here. Terrific. All in, uh, roll call vote. Heather. Yes. Tara. Yes. Ethan. Yes. Kumara. Yes. Okay, Annie. I think we're we've concluded that one. Thank you, team, for that. Um, it's always nice to reward our hardworking employees for the good work that they are doing. Um, so thank you, um, colleagues who um, work with us here at Hadley Public Schools. All right, any is that it for us? Do we just adjourn at this point? Motion to adjourn the meeting. All so right. I get it. And all in favor. Aye. Aye. Terrific. Oh, this is going to take me some time to get used to it. <laughs> <We'll> get it. <laughs> Great. Forward. So thank you for bearing with me. Appreciate your support through all of it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Have a Bye. great night.